Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, webinar this morning. We're just going to give uh, everyone a couple of minutes to trickle in, so we'll get started in about, uh, in about two minutes. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our uh, webinar this morning. Uh, we're just going to give everyone a couple of minutes to trickle in, so uh, hang out for a couple of minutes, and we'll get started in, uh, in about two or three minutes. Let's get started. We are uh, very excited to have you join us for the webinar this morning. <clears throat> we, uh, we have a ton of great information to share with you. My name is Jeremy Easton, and I am Sustainable Travel International's Director of Marketing. Uh, this is part two of our social media series, and today's topic builds off last week. We're really excited to have uh, Donnie Clapp of Mercury CSC back to lead us through After the Honeymoon, Keeping Your Social Media Audience Engaged for the Long Term. A couple of ground rules before we get started, just reminders for those of you who have attended before. Um, the audience is muted throughout uh, the presentation, but we do encourage uh, communication via the chat tool. So please um, say hello or submit questions um, via the chat tool that's on your um, GoToWebinar application. We will leave about 15 minutes for Q&A at the end, so please submit questions uh, at any time during the presentation. Um, and we will get to as many of them as we can at the end. Um, those that we don't get to answer live, we will follow up with directly um, via email. Um, in terms of our agenda, I'm going to just give a very brief uh, overview of STI, then I'll turn it over to Donnie, uh, and I'll be back at the end uh, to lead the Q&A and uh, share a few closing thoughts. Um, we do send out the presentation um, a few hours after the webinar is over, we always get a lot of questions about this. So a couple hours after we're done, we'll send out a presentation and uh, the full audio recording so that you guys um, will have a copy. And please feel free to share that with others as well. Um, Donnie, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, so just want to share a little bit with you about, um, about STI. Sustainable Travel International is a... A global organization, we're focused on providing sustainability solutions that help tourism businesses and destinations have a positive impact on the triple bottom line. So that means protecting the environment, preserving cultural heritage, and contributing to economic development. Um, STI, we work with a, a variety of destination and business partners across the travel and tourism industry through a variety of programs, uh, programs that we offer. Um, we work with businesses across the value chain. We partner with destinations and multinational corporations, and we offer sustainability management tools for small to medium-sized businesses as well. Um, as you can see here, we've been working with 
destinations and travel and tourism industry leaders worldwide um, since 2002, um, including some key players in the industry and destinations worldwide. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Donnie, and uh, I'll be back at the end to uh, to uh, share the Q&A with you guys. Looking forward to the presentation. Thank you, Jeremy. Hi, everyone. I'm going to bring up a video of myself. If you were here last week, you'll know that this video is almost useless uh, as far as actual video, but it does um, help you connect the words with a face, a smiling one. So hopefully you enjoy that. My name is Donnie Clapp, and this is After the Honeymoon, keeping your social media audience engaged for the long term. I want to welcome you, and I want to say thanks to FCI for inviting me to give this. I had a ton of fun last week, and I feel like it went really well, and um, a lot of people told me that they enjoyed it. So hopefully this week will go the same way, and uh, we can continue to uh, improve everybody's social media strategy. So again, I'm Donnie Clapp. I'm at Donnie Clapp. On Twitter, I work for a company called Mercury CSC. This picture um, is of me at the World Keg Hurling Championships in Whitefish at Oktoberfest last weekend. Um, I did throw kegs farther than any of the competitors. However, I was the MC, so it didn't count, and I didn't win. Uh, who is Mercury CSC? Mercury CSC connects brands to consumers who value authentic places and immersive experiences. MercuryCSC.com going to type that in for you and imprint it into your brain. There it is. Pull it up. Beautiful website. These uh, things right here, tell your story frankly, and then the next one that's going to come up, um, inspire your tribe. These are our five pillars, our five messages that we say, we propose that any business involved in the travel industry, whether it's actual travel destinations, DMOs, or retail businesses who pay and who have a target audience, target audience that values travel in authentic places, which that describes all the companies we work with. Um, our view is that you, those companies, need to do these five things to be successful. Tell your story frankly. Be who you are. If you were here last week for the webinar, um, and in fact, uh, we have full video of the webinar that Jeremy and SCI were nice, to, nice enough to put up online, and you can find that if you if you twirl open your Go to webinar little panel on the side. You'll be able to see that Molly, my lovely assistant, is uh, posting links to these things, such as the video of the webinar and the slides from last week. Anyway, if you were here last week, you know that almost the entire presentation last week was about telling your story frankly and how important it is to be who you are and how easily people can see through you if you're not being who you are. Next, uh, inspire your tribe. Um, localize as much as possible. Convey your expertise. Importantly, this does not mean pretend you're an expert. It means if you are an expert, make sure and leverage that. And finally, integrate mindfulness and sustainability into the business itself um, rather than just talking about it. And also, uh, in today's climate, if you're not doing this, you are behind the rest of the competition. Luckily, all you guys are already on that boat or you wouldn't be at this webinar with SPI. So these five things inform everything that Mercury does from branding uh, research, business strategy, traditional marketing, social media, PR, the whole kaboom, and it definitely informs my strategy on social media. It really integrates well, and what I'm going to talk about today is how social media sort of integrates with all those other things anyway, so it's a nice little circle. Um, I want to start out with this quote, the more contrived the world seems, the more we all demand what's real. That's from Joe Pine and Jill, Jim Gilmore, authors of Authenticity, What Consumers Really Want, Pretty good book, great quote, um, and I think it is even more important in our industry, in the travel and tourism industry, um, travel-focused retail, than anywhere else. I think that our customers uh, are on the leading edge of demanding authenticity and what's real above and beyond consumers in general. Um, you'll notice at the bottom left of every slide, we have hashtag after the honeymoon. What does that mean? That means if you're on Twitter, I want you to check in with us at hashtag after the honeymoon. Um, you'll find that one thing that will make this easier to do is if you go to tweet chat and put in after the honeymoon in this little box up here at the top, 
you'll be able to see exactly what's going on. And if you click the sign in button and sign in with your Twitter account, you can it'll automatically update and you can add stuff to the conversation. You don't have to remember to actually type the hashtag. Very super useful. I'm gonna size this down and put it here in the corner for you. So you can watch what's happening in the Twitter world. Um, otherwise you can use the tool of your choice, Hootsuite, Twitter's own website, etc. But definitely check in and feel free to ask questions uh, there on Twitter or in the GoToWebinar interface. Jeremy's going to be watching both places and we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. So, some old news. This is especially old news if you were here last week, but probably old news for anybody at an advanced social media webinar. We won't spend too much time on it. In the U.S., social media equals 23% of time spent online. Oh my gosh. And so on and so forth. Social media is important. You should be doing it. We all know this. <laughs> Here's a graph I had last week as well. Percent of time spent online in the U.S. Facebook skyrocketing. Oh, this hand. Skyrocketing. Everybody else staying flat or rising slightly or declining. So, to the presentation. Weddings. Fun. Honeymoon. Super fun. Marriages can be fun, but how do we make, how do people successfully turn a fun day, night, and then week or two into a lifetime of satisfying togetherness and passionate um, conversation and relationships. I'm going to start out with, and which I assume is a magazine for women, and uh, I like these five. I added one at the end. Big goodbye to domination. Um, this is really important with marriage, of course, but also between a brand and its customers. For a long time, pretty much forever, actually. Well, since brands have gotten bigger than your local butcher as a brand, and the consumer has not had an equal spot at the table, not only does social media bring consumers an equal spot at the table, but it makes it you don't have to try to force a one-to-one -one conversation where both sides have the same amount of power and the same amount of feeling of ownership, and that's really important. And you have to, if you try to force you force the conversation to not be equal footed, it will come off as not authentic and it will not work. Devote enough time to your partner. This is also important. Marriages where one where the people do not hang out with each other um, but are married on paper do not usually last. Help your marriage with the beauty of honesty. Again, harkens back to last week's presentation and of course our first pillar, tell your story frankly. On, your customers know when you're being honest or you're not and actually the more brutally honest you can be, the more your customers will respect you in good times and in bad. If you can't quite stomach brutal honesty, get as close as you can and you'll find yourself being more successful in developing better relationships. Keep the passion going. A marriage is not a casual relationship. It is based on love, this strong, passionate relationship emotion and your relationship with your customers is the same way. A very successful long-term customer relationship inclu includes passion. Think about Apple fans, people who buy every iPhone when it comes out, whether they need one or not. Those fans are passionate and Apple is, or has been in the past, passionate about its customers as, as well. And also passionate about what it does. Um, luckily in our industry, we passion is easy to come by. People are always very passionate about going on vacation and um, beautiful places and, and uh, cool products. So not a super hard thing to come across brand consumer relationship for sure. Follow the theory of acceptance. This means that you cannot change who the other person is. True in a marriage, true in your relationship with your customers. You cannot change how your customers feel about you, what they think about you, at least not very easily. You can definitely not change how they feel about the world very easily. What you have to do to develop a respect successful long-term relationship is either accept the customers you have and their traits and try to build upon those traits to improve your relationship or change yourself to meet their expectations or find new customers. And that is a valid strategy, but not one people choose often. Keep the lines of communication open. Very important. If you don't keep listening and they don't keep listening and you don't keep talking and they also don't keep talking, you're going nowhere fast. A lot of people, parents, have relationships like that. Um, this is from my buddy Troy over at Travel 2.0 and his partner, Travel2.0.com. You can see there at the top. Um, 
he has a lot of really great stuff on travel industry and social media, um, including awesome infographics. Here he's combined some stuff. He's got one sort of uh, communication cycle at the bottom and a customer acquiring or a purchase decision process across the yellow line. You'll see that after the experience, Troy says that people either drop off, satisfaction level drops off over time quickly, or after the actual experience, it continues to go up. And the difference is how well you're maintaining that marriage, that relationship with your customer. Um, <laughs> I like Mike Carrollton's tweet. Um, tools are cool. So we know that to be a successful, be in a successful marriage or to have a successful long-term relationship with your customers, you have to do these things. You have to keep the passion alive and keep communication open. Um, and you have tools to do that with. Um, I want to say that although each tool is useful by itself, they're much more powerful as a set. A person with a box of tools builds a that person might not ever finish a whole house. Um, I know last week I said that if you're just starting out, just pick one, probably Facebook, and do the best you can to spend as much time as you can there, get a feel for your customers, get a feel for your own brand's voice, and develop from there. Oops. Excuse me while I get back to the slide I was on. I apologize. Um, but in the long term, if you're serious about an integrated social media strategy that's going to keep your customers in a relationship that's going to be satisfying and passionate, for both sides for a long time, you're going to need to combine a whole lot of tools together to build a house for you both to live in. Ah, cute, right? Um, so after pumping Troy up over travel food, I don't know, I'm going to poke a little fun at him here. This is another infographic that he's done or they've done. And this is a simple explanation of the new brand consumer interaction sort of graph. And it is not simple at all. It is pretty complicated. I have an alternative look at it. And I am not nearly as good an artist as Troy, but I think it gets the job done. On the left, your brand. On the right, your customers. In the middle, time. Now time can represent a lot of things. It can represent mediums that are one way, so it blocks the return communication from ever, ever happening, um, whether the one way communication is from your customers to you or from your brand to your customers. Time can mean middlemen and the process of developing a message and then uh, accumulating responses and then replying. The point is time blocks a real-time, actual marriage-like relationship between your customers. And what you have to do is figure out ways to break through that time barrier. And luckily, what social media has done is it's changed it possible, breaking through. I'm going to give a quick shout-out to this guy. His name is Gary Vaynerchuk. His dad had a little internet first started. He was taking over his dad's business and decided to go whole hog into the internet space. He became the biggest, the largest seller of wine on the internet, winelibrary.com. And since then, he's sort of moved into social media consulting. Very smart guy. Wrote a book called The Thank You Economy. And if I could recommend one book that represents what I think um, social media means to the business customer relationship and to the sort of business landscape overall, I would recommend this one. My favorite quote from the book, people's bullshit radars are insane. Marketing is about to get really, really hard. And um, it's very true. And like I said before, the people in our industry have the best bullshit radars out there. So we have to work even harder. But if we're willing to find our brand's true voice, go back and watch the last week's webinar if you have to. Find your brand's true voice and then develop these long-lasting, passionate relationships with our customers. Social media makes that possible, where 10 years ago that was absolutely not possible for a business of any size. So my way to break through that time box is with an integrated campaign. An integrated campaign combines social media with other mediums and social media platforms with other social media platforms. So you all know the old Spice Man, the man's man. Smell like a man's man. Um, old Spice did not set out to do a social media integrated campaign. They set out to do a traditional TV advertising campaign, and it was a very successful one. So several months later, they sort of relaunched with a social media integration in mind. That was one of the best social media integrations of any campaign, and what you come up with when you do that is a ping pong effect. What they did is they had T 
TV spot with the guy, I'm sure you've all seen him a million times, um, doing manly things, which sent you to a website. The website, uh, and they also were uh, encouraging people on social media channels like Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, and Dig to submit stories. The website encourages you to do the same thing using these tools so that your um, questions for the Old Spice Man were shared with your friends and others. Those questions were then voted up, and in the course of two days, Old Spice and its uh, agency created 200 professionally um, edited videos with the Old Spice Man answering people's questions with the same amount of like cr clean, crisp dialogue and humor as the original TV spots. Two days, 200 video responses, 11 million views on those videos, and it went so huge that all traditional media and especially um, tech media covered it in mass and for a long time. Very impressive. Now, this I wouldn't call this a long-term successful campaign because after the initial push, their Twitter account and other uh, channels went dead. They went silent, and they have not maintained that passion. They have not kept the communications line open. There's people still asking them questions that they just don't answer, at least the last time I checked, was, which was a while ago. They might have seen the error in their ways and be trying to rebuild now. Um, but very successful at breaking down that time barrier. Here's a smaller scale example. This is Get Lost. Get Lost. MT.com is where you can find this. This is a travel, uh, a social travel planning and uh, experience sharing website that we have built for the Montana Office of Tourism. Um, <clears throat> it's been very successful. It's been alive for about eight months. It didn't start out looking like this. It started out as just a place to submit stories for prizes. Now those stories are, there's thousands of them, about hundreds of places in Montana to eat, stay, and play, and they provide a very valuable and very authentic travel planning resource for people both in state and coming from out of state. And we did a similar thing. When we launched it, we didn't just launch it as a website. We launched it as a TV campaign on local Montana TV stations. Here's some stills from some of the spots. We had newspaper ads in local newspapers across the state saying, get lost. And most importantly, probably, oh, and we had these funny um, fake lost and found posters that we put up all across the state, including the little tape ones that said getlost.com instead of having a phone number. All very effective. Most effective of all is the thing right in the center of this slide, and that was these stickers that say get lost in Montana. It's a bumper sticker. Basically, you'll notice no website um, on at least some versions of it, and that was on purpose. We wanted to create a sticker that was so un promotional of a specific thing that it took off and demand did take off. We could have given away as many of these as we wanted to print. We distributed them around the state through a gas station chain and state parks and some other things. Those all those things all bounced off each other to get people to this site. And then from there it started bouncing back and forth off of social media. So again we're combining we're not replacing traditional media with social media. We're combining social media with traditional media and PR, etc. And the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. When we're able to bounce TV and newspapers and broadcast off of bumper stickers, off of Facebook and Twitter to a central website and then back again out to all the different ones and rinse and repeat that whole process, we're able to do much more than we could have with any three or two or one of these mediums to spread the message and help people travel better, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been very successful. Eight months in, I think we're doing 15,000 visits visitors a month. There's thousands of like registered people who actually share stories. It's kind of amazing. Um, uh, and a good story of this ping pong effect that Vaynerchuk talks about in his book, which by the way that Old Spice example is taken directly from his book. I did not find that on my own. Uh, this is a third example that I think is um, uh, like the next scale smaller just so you understand that these large scale projects are not the only ones that can do this ping pong effect. Even something like partnering with a traditional, or not traditional, but a journalistic um, media source for a contest like SBI has done here with response to travel report, that creates a little bit of a ping pong effect. You're combining the exposure at responsible travel report with the activity and sharing and et cetera on the Facebook page itself and back and forth and back and forth, and the end effect is greater 
than it would have been without the other. So, first example of how to straight tear down the time barrier is uh, integrating your campaign across media channels, including social media, traditional media, PR, etc. And the scale is not important. It's, it's not that only big scales work, all scales work. It's that the more channels you can involve, even if it's just multiple social media channels, the greater the combined effect. The more audiences you're able to leverage and combine with each other. So the second way is um, from the perspective of journalism. For a long time, forever, um, the only way to tell, to reliably tell a first person narrative story about your product or destination to your audience was to find a publication for which their audience um, had a portion of that audience that is your audience, um, entice a journalist to come experience your product or destination in some way, and then have them write an article about that uh, product or experience and send it off to their audience at some point. Uh, used to be that turnaround cycle was really long, six months, a year, two years. Now it's much shorter, but you still have to, you can't, even if uh, you really like the journalist and you really like the outlet, it's still just one outlet who their audience is only partially your audience, the people you want to be talking to. And sometimes it's a niche and um, et cetera. And it's not that that's not important. Much in the same way that I'm saying integrating social media with traditional media is the only way to create these big effects and get the most bang for your time and effort. Um, I think combining traditional journalism with what I'm about to be talking about is the, only, is the best way to get the most bang for your effort. So, um, this was also kind of inspired by Gary Vee. Um, we have, um, one of our clients is Custer Country or Southeast Montana, which is one of the six tourism regions in Montana, but it's not one of the two or three kind of that has a huge um, draw in it. Uh, this Southeast Montana does not have Glacier National Park or Yellowstone National Park. It does have some awesome stuff, but it doesn't have a whole lot of mountains, at least not ones that are super accessible. It doesn't have a whole lot of um, lakes. It does have rivers and good fishing, um, but it's not what people think about when they think about the national parks and mountainous regions, et cetera. And it's not, importantly, the part of the state that is normally put forward as the draw to come here. Being in Glendive, Montana, to get Yellowstone caviar from the paddlefish in the Yellowstone River. Very good caviar, some of the best in the world. I bet you didn't know that was there. Um, what we did is we took three days. We drove all. We drove a thousand miles around Southeast Montana. I took one piece of equipment, and that is my smartphone, my Android smartphone. I took pictures along the way and posted a first-person narrative of our experience. I didn't warn people we we're going to do this. We just started on a Sunday morning. Started posting. And what you see here on this slide is this is a record of the Facebook portion of that campaign. We got that those three days accounted for the second best week, if you discount the week that those three days are a part of, in the history of the Montana Facebook page. So those three days is, are were amazingly more popular than anything else we've done, and it didn't include any of the things that are people's very favorite things about Montana, at least as far as um, the main draws. So it was exposing people to new things, and it was amazing. 5,000 likes and comments in three days. Um, the post consisted of things like this, an ugly, badly taken picture, badly lit of a not pretty plate that I, and I didn't even take the picture until after I ate the food. Lunch for six, Nico Lack, a $21, good lunch, too. Notice I'm not, I am being honest and authentic. One of the pinnacles of maintaining a marriage with my customers. I'm not saying, man, the food is amazing at this diner in Ecolaca. I'm not trying to play it up to be something it's not. I'm not bringing up a bunch of photographic equipment in and taking super pretty pictures. I'm just a person on the ground um, as if I were not part of the promotional establishment for this destination, but rather somebody experiencing it and journaling it as a journalist might do. And it was very, very effective. What we found is that there's this whole group of people out there who these unique and um, 
off the beaten path destinations, these state parks that don't get any visitors that are amazing and look like the moon um, with these crazy rocks and these tiny restaurants in these tiny towns and these rivers and these churches and these um, crazy hotels and really quirky signs. All this stuff in eastern Montana, southeastern Montana, had a whole group of people that were already fans of Montana and the page who were waiting, desperately waiting for a chance to be brand advocates for southeast Montana and who, which you would not expect maybe anybody outside of Eagle Eye to have done, who, ju who jumped on the opportunity to say, I've done that too. I've been there and it is awesome and you are awesome for having gone there and it was, it was really cool to see. Um, and it's, I think actually if I count the last, if I remember from the last slide, 5,000 likes and comments, unprecedented engagement from people who were not normally engaged in the past when we talked about our the Grand Pillars for Montana, East Glacier, Yellowstone, et cetera, and also unprecedented engagement during off hours. We started a Sunday morning at 7.30, and from the word go, this is some of the most popular stuff that we've done on the Montana Facebook page and through the Montana Twitter account. Um, super exciting. And basically what we have done with this experiment is we've turned ourselves into journalists. I've been alluding to that a little bit, but I just want to say that out loud. We've turned ourselves into journalists. And that doesn't mean we're not going to have a PR team anymore that's trying to get as many journalists from as many places as possible to come cover Montana. It just means that there's this new, new channel, this channel that doesn't include that time block in the middle where we can be acting as journalists on the ground, telling stories that we know there's a part of our audience out there that wants to hear, and maybe they can't hear it, maybe it's not the thing that the journalists we can get to come necessarily want to cover. And that conversation can turn two-way in real time very quickly. In fact, when we were doing this, people started following along. We even had one person that was following us that like tracked us down in the middle of southeastern Montana in this tiny little town and said, are you guys the people that are doing the Facebook thing? It was, it was pretty awesome. Um, I just want to talk quickly about what's possible. I think that this experiment proves this concept that we can have this direct brand to consumer journalism that maintains the passion in the relationship and opens the lines of communication and maintain, uh, gets rid of the dominance. Um, all those things that we said we needed to do to have a successful marriage and a successful brand consumer relationship, it really cuts through that time barrier and allows that all. And I think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. I think that there are four things that we could do in the future and that you should do when you try these things out. And keep in mind, I was working for a destination, so mine was a road trip, but that's not the only thing that works. Anything, like if you imagine the perfect story, if you could go out and find the perfect journalist from the perfect outlet, like outside or National Geographic or whatever your perfect outlet is, perfect journalist comes and they have the perfect experience with your travel destination or product, what, what does that story read like? And then figure out how to tell it yourself. Don't wait for them, okay? And what you can do, I think, to make it even better, you can build anticipation. We didn't do that. We didn't warn people it was happening. We just started posting on a Sunday morning and went through Tuesday. Um, I think that if you built up for a while, you can not only in, in increase the audience, but you can um, integrate into real life, uh, which I'll talk about at goal point four. Two, expand other channels. We were primarily on Facebook. Um, this was an experiment. We didn't know how it would go. I think that this um, is valid on all channels, and that, like I said before, integrating channels, um, you get the ping pong effect, and everything becomes more successful. So I think that definitely this is a multi-channel kind of thing. Extend the life of the content. One of the problems with the way that we did it is it lived on Facebook. And after a few days, after the three days that we were out there on the ground, all the posts with the thousands of likes and comments and this robust conversation between the people who were like, oh my gosh, I love the thing in Ecolaca that you went to or that crazy sign in Glendive. It's gone forever. It's sucked down into the deep dark black hole that is uh, Facebook wall history and I think there's an opportunity to shift the main content onto a blog or a microsite of some sort. It doesn't have to be fancy. You can start a blogger account or a WordPress account. Do it there and then post links to that blog onto your social media channels. Make it all live in one place. That way people months from now can go back and relive the experience chronologically um, and they have an easier time resharing uh, the content. Fourth thing is integrating into real life. I think there's a huge opportunity here, especially with the road trips, but with whatever you're doing, especially if you've built anticipation and people are looking forward to this sort of thing going on, to 
to meet up with people, say, um, when we're traveling around, if we we're going to get to one place that's on a freeway somewhere, and we say, hey, on Sunday at 5, meet us here, we're going to take a big group picture up in Los Angeles. Um, that kind of stuff can be amazing. And experiences like that for customers, I've had one where I was having an online experience with a brand, and it got parlayed into a real life experience with a brand that I wasn't really expecting, um, made me a passionate fan um, and partner of that brand for life. So that's what I think. Um, I know that I, I, I glossed over some, or I didn't, um, I wish I could talk more deeply, but uh, we only have an hour. And I'd be glad to talk to anybody more deeply on Twitter, over the phone, email, whatever you like, about any of this stuff. I think it's really important. I think that um, as Gary Vaynerchuk has said, this social media sort of revolution, it's already happened. It's not happening. It's happened. We're there. We're living in this new thank you economy, which means that the way to, that we maintain our relationships with our customers is different than it has been for the past hundred years. And if you don't get on board, you're going to be left behind. On the, on the same, on the other side of the same coin, though, most people aren't on board yet. Most people are not fully embracing this new time, uh, you know, breaking through the time barrier and talking directly to your customers paradigm. And if you and your brand are able to do that, if you're able to go back to my first webinar last week, find your true brand voice, figure out exactly who your customers are, talk to them in the, in the right voice, and then employ some of these other techniques to bounce channels off of one another and um, cut through that time barrier, I think you have a chance to really, really differentiate, differentiate yourself from your competitors and become an example and, and really increase your success. So I wish you the best. I hope that you guys start integrating some of this stuff. I know you've been asking questions for the past 35 minutes. Jeremy's going to start reading some soon. Um, and thanks again to Jeremy and SPI for, for allowing me to talk. Uh, <clears throat> thanks so much, Donnie, and uh, another great presentation. I, I know I learned a lot, and hopefully everyone will too. Um, we do have a bunch of questions coming in, so um, let's just start firing away. Um, Donnie, uh, you, you talked a little bit about um, about honesty and um, you know creating content that feels feels real, feels authentic, feels honest. Um, in terms of uh, what that might lead to on, on your social media platform, on your Facebook page, um, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on uh, encouraging constructive criticism or, or even negative reviews from customers. You know, arguably, there's this is a good thing and a good chance to, to really hear from customers and, and really make your, your social media or your Facebook page look and feel more real. Um, so I'm curious about your thoughts on that and, and also on, on how to handle and those kinds of interactions with your, with your customers. Yeah, well, so I think you know, if we if we keep with this, excuse me, this marriage metaphor, um, marriages don't work if you only have the easy conversations, right? What really draws you closer together in the end is having the hard conversations, is having the fights, and talking through them, and discovering the common ground that you actually still have, and working hard to make sure that. Um, you do better in the future. And it's the same with your brand. It's the same with your destination or your product. Um, having those hard conversations is really important. And a lot of people are very scared of having the hard conversations on their Facebook page or on Twitter, out in the open, um, on a site like Get Satisfaction where it loops forever and people can go back and look at the rants and the rates. Um, but you shouldn't be scared of it because all that means when it's out in the open, when you're giving people a place, to be upset and to talk to you about being upset, and you're able to, there's, there's two good things. One, you get to respond in public. You get to prove your authenticity and meet, meet and exceed people's expectations and posts about you, your brand, and personality, um, and that's good. The other thing is, because people are having these things, saying these things on your channel that you know that you're paying attention to, they're not going to be saying these things on some other channel that's just as public, but that you're not paying attention to, especially not in real time. So I'd much rather, um, in the case of Montana or um, a resort that I've, that I've run a Facebook page for in the past that had a lot of controversy and, and a lot of occasionally um, negative and, and passionately negative conversations happening on the Facebook page, 
much rather have it happening there than on some other Facebook group um, that I don't know exists or some forum, Tucson Gravity Research or, or some forum out there that I'm not paying close attention to. Much rather have it right in front of me under my nose. I can respond immediately and I know that I'm a rational brand. My personality is rational and lovable in the end and the reasons that I've done things are good reasons and if I can just continue to tell the truth and get the truth out there, my rationality will overcome all other irrationality. People are very good as much as their bullshit radars are good and they can tell if you as your brand are trying to bullshit them. They also are very good, they have very good irrationality radars. There's lots of ranting and raving on the internet and people have a good filter for that. They'll ignore or even if they're not ignoring it, they will um, dismiss irrational behavior, especially if it's met with rational behavior from the other side. So I, I think that if you are trying to avoid the hard conversations on your social media channels, you're missing out on one of the biggest opportunities of your social media channels, which is containing those negative conversations in one place that you have control of, um, and also responding in public and not having to have the same conversation a hundred times. Thanks, Sonny. Um, <clears throat> Facebook uh, is changing pretty rapidly and, and uh, seems to be changing all the time. And there was a very recently Facebook released uh, really a whole new set of changes. And I'm wondering if there's anything um, anything there that you can share with uh, with the group about those changes and how they might impact um, you know the work everyone's doing on Facebook right now. Sure. So now uh, you know. Now there's not just the timeline on your own page, there's the timeline and the timeline 2.0 or whatever they're calling it. Um, it doesn't really change, I mean it changes uh, a little bit the way that you interact and it might eventually lead to new best practices um, but really if you're coming from the place that I'm asking you to come from, if you're coming from the place of, and there's other, there's other subtle changes than that, um, one good change is that they tell you how many people have shared the stories from that you posted to your page, whereas before they just told you how many people liked or commented. That's a big change that I love. Um, a lot of the interface changes, though. A, it's hard to say. I know a lot of people will say, "This is how this will affect you." Nobody knows um, until it happens. And the other thing is, if the place you're coming from is, "I know who I am," and I know who you are, and the tool is just the medium. It's just where the message is traveling back and forth. You will have no trouble adapting to that medium evolving. And, and it will. It'll continue to evolve, and there will be new tools. I mean, much more crazy than Facebook changing slightly is if there's a whole new Facebook, like if Google Plus continues its meteoric rise, um, and you end up needing to be on Google Plus. That's a lot harder than dealing with um, small changes to Facebook and the way it works. I mean, in the end, I feel like Facebook is still a place where almost everybody in America goes, almost everybody, almost every day and where brands have a really good chance to have good conversations with their customers. So um, if you're, I'm not a 27 tips for taking advantage of X, Y, and Z, or five best ways to do um, A, B, and C kind of guy. I'm more of a um, find your authentic self and put it out into the world. Um, the same way you would like if you're experimenting with a new, like let's say you created a Google Plus channel. No? Um, then uh, you're experimenting for yourself. It's, it's the same way. If you really know your brand as a personality, then experimenting and um, getting comfortable and taking the best advantage of social media channels that you can is the same way. It's, um, it's the same way. I was going to ask you about Google Plus, and maybe you could share a little bit with uh, with everyone. Uh, you know, just a quick primer. What what do people need to know about Google Plus and is it something you feel you feel you know, people should be investing you know time and, and energy into right now? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I'm a big uh, geek, so of course I feel like I want everybody to be on it so that it's more useful to me, right? Because we can tell everybody's on it, it's not as useful as Facebook. Um, you know, as of right now, you can't you can't really there's not official support for brands on Google Plus. It is purely an individual platform. So unless your brand is you. Um, which it might be, unless your brand is you, um, Google Plus is not um, something that you need to be taking advantage of as a brand right now. 
Um, but it is a very intriguing development in social media. It's a different take on the whole way things work. It's kind of like this weird Frankenstein of Facebook and Twitter where most of your stuff is by default public. And actually, a lot of the changes that you've seen recently to Facebook, like people can subscribe to you now instead of just being friends, and you have these groups that they're trying to create for you automatically so you're not sharing everything with everybody. Those are directly stolen from Google Plus because they're things that Google Plus did well um, that Facebook decided they needed to adopt um, to maintain their edge. I don't necessarily agree. I don't think that, I don't personally think that the subscribe feature on Facebook is necessary or a good idea because I think pages work much better for that purpose. Um, but yeah, Google Plus is cool, and if you're not on it, I'd encourage you to go ahead and create an account. You can definitely um, search for me and find me um, and uh, start talking to me. It's, it's uh, the basic premise is that everybody that you become friends with on Google Plus or follow on Google Plus goes into a bucket, a circle they call it, and when you share things, you only share them with certain buckets or with everybody, depending on what you want to do. And when you receive things, you can filter it according to those buckets. Um, and it's very effective. And um, posts are searchable by default, which is good. And, and they will be opening up the brands at some point in the future. So I would definitely keep your eye on Google Plus. Um, it's one of those things where um, first the first person in the party, if that party ends up taking off, um, feels pretty good and, and gets to reap the rewards. But you can't always predict which party is going to um, be the rate to be the best best one after the Oscars. Awesome, thanks. Especially if that party is a uh, is October Fest related. Um, I wanted to ask a couple people have, have asked about contests and just curious to get your your take on on contests and. You know, when are they a good idea? You know, what 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 goal <laughs> do they really help serve? And you obviously mentioned contests a little bit, and thank you for the the plug for for SDI's current contest. <laughs> Just love to get your thoughts on that. Um, yeah, well, so um, I am not in most cases. Um, I think that there are better way to build fans than with contests, but the right can be very effective, um, and. The, the danger that you have, like, let's say you're um, a travel brand and you decide to give away an iPad 2 or uh, an iPod 4 or something. When you decide to do that, a lot of the people that are going to sign up for your contest and become fans, and I do put that in quotes, of your brand in order to try to win, um, they don't actually care about your brand. And the problem with that is it, it dilutes your audience and creates an audience that is not full of passionate partners um, in a marriage. It's uh, it's kind of like if, if uh, you're married for 20 years and then you decide to go start uh, cruising singles bars again, <laughs> kind of. Um, however, that being said, I actually like the operation with, with that site. And to enter, you have to tell a story about sustainability, and it relates directly to the brand that you're promoting. And I, I don't think the reason I like it is because I can't really imagine very many people going to the trouble of telling a story about sustainability that aren't at least somewhat interested in sustainability in the travel industry. And so I think that most of the fans you're going to gain through that contest um, are going to be real fans, at least people that have the potential to be real fans. Um, I, it's definitely true. The other thing I want to say is I think contests and giveaways, promotions, some things to do for people that are already your fans. I think this is something that people forget a lot is that one of the best things you can do for the people that have been supporting you all along all this time and have already found you and decided to, to um, have this conversation and this, this great relationship with you is to give them a little reward. You know, take them on a date. It's Valentine's Day. Send them some chocolate, you know. And, and it's obviously a metaphor unless you're in the chocolate business, but it's uh, I think that's a great use of that is to turn your existing fans into better existing fans, turn your mediocre fans into huge, loyal, passionate brand advocates, and turn your brand new fans into people that will be around for the long term. I think that's my favorite use of contests and giveaways, and that's something that I um, recommend to all my clients. Yeah, I would actually add that um, <clears throat> it's a nice way to either develop new strategic partnerships or take advantage of strategic partnerships that you're already 
um, that you're already engaged in. You know, like STI has a has a strategic partnership with Royal Caribbean, and that's a an opportunity that we saw to reach uh, to reach a, a, a larger audience uh, by engaging yeah. in a in a co promoted co promote opportunity. Um, yeah, Donnie, we asked the question last week. And, um, I think good promotion. Great. Um, Donnie, we asked this question last week, and I, I think it's really relevant to ask it again um, and see if the answer is any different, because um, given the, the content of this webinar, um, I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on you know, an organization with limited time and resources who's trying to engage in social media. You know, we asked last week, what, where do you spend that, that limited time and resources when you're getting started with social media? So I'm going to ask it again. Um, around this topic of you know keeping the audience engaged, if you have sort of limited time, limited limited budget, um, you know how can you how can you continue to focus on this over the long term? What's the one or two things um, that you'd make sure you know make sure everyone does from? Yeah, sure. So uh, the answer is the same and different at the same time. If you have limited time and resources, then the recommendation is still are small. Pick one platform, probably Facebook, spend 15 minutes, two or three times a day maintaining that platform, making sure that you're there for any kind However, the sort of hard truth about a little bit about how the game has changed. And there's a huge opportunity because not every, most people have not realized it yet and are not playing the new game as well as it could be played. If you want to, you can be, you can really set yourself apart and be the, one of the most successful players um, in this new game. And rise above and beyond your competition, but that's not going to happen with limited time and resources. The reality is that if you want to be successful in the long term and succeed in this new sort of economy, the new way that business works with customers, you're going to have to dedicate serious time and resources to not social media, um, just social media, but this new way of thinking about your customers as people who are equal partners in a relationship that you have to work just as hard to maintain. To get started is still just to get started, but the best way to set yourself apart and be the best in the business in whatever business you're in is to be the best in the new social media economy, and that's going to take some real effort and time. So there's this huge spectrum, right? Um, I think that you can be relatively successful with a very small effort, um, but there's a then there's a huge gap between relatively successful and you know the meteoric success um, that you may be after, and if that's what you're after, um, you got to look at it the same way you look at any of your other business building techniques, like um, going out after you know any of the other ways you go after new business, um, marketing, advertising, PR, um, promotions, partnerships. All those things take serious time and effort too, um, and it's not fair really to look at social media any differently. It it takes just as much time and effort, and and I think in the long term, this sort of idea, this sort of world is going to take over all the time and effort that you currently put towards traditional forms of customer service. So in that way, it will be a one-to-one -one trade. But in the present, the hard truth is that if you want to excel, if you want to exceed expectations, um, you're going to have to exceed uh, your current expenditures. Well, we are uh, we are out of time for questions. Um, Donnie, thank you so so much for all the great information and for taking everyone's questions. And you know, I kind of wish we could do this every week. <laughs> so uh, perhaps we'll uh, get together again for some uh, some great topics in the future. Um, but thank you again, really really great information and, and um, just great conversation. A lot a lot to think about from here. Um, so I have a couple of closing uh, closing uh, slides and housekeeping items um, to share. Uh, a couple just closing slides and housekeeping items um, to share with you all. Um, Sustainable Travel International, uh, we, we offer a variety of, of programs uh, for um, our business and partners. Just wanted to share what a couple of those uh, are with you. And there's a, a lot of, obviously, a lot more information on our website. Um, if you're interested in, in talking with us directly, we're going to be sending a survey out after this. And, after this presentation, and in the survey, there's an opportunity for you to, to request um, to request a uh, one of our teams. So we'd love to talk with you about our programs, and um, please visit our website if you're uh, interested in learning more as well. 
next slide. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items. As I mentioned at the beginning, we will send out the presentation and audio recording um, via email uh, within a couple of hours, so just keep an eye out for that. Um, we do survey our webinar participants after uh, each webinar, and we really appreciate your participation in that survey. It's, it's really important for us to hear your feedback and gives us an opportunity to continue improving our educational series, and it also gives you a chance to um, submit ideas for future webinars, and social media is an example of, uh, of a webinar that we created uh, based, on, based on input from people. So please, um, please do fill out that survey. Um, all participants will be eligible to, uh, to win a 30 media strategy session with Donnie, um, which I know would be extremely valuable. So uh, please do take the survey, and we'll be picking a winner. Um, thanks. Finally, I just want to share with you our next webinar, um, which will be October 12th. As we've heard a, a lot of requests uh, for, and it's, uh, it's called Sustainability Management 101, Ready, Set, Action, and it's going to be an action-packed hour. <laughs> um, our, uh, our vision here is that we'll be exploring best practices um, in key operational areas so that you have real tangible takeaways. Uh, where it's going to be an hour just filled with... Um, filled with action and, and, uh, and next steps for you to, to take from here in terms of managing your sustainability. So this is for those who are interested in, in really getting started with their um, sustainability management, uh, management solutions. So it's a 101 course, meaning uh, primarily for uh, beginners in sustainability. And uh, finally, just uh, another contact slide so um, you know how to reach us. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, and that is all for today. Thank you so much, and we'll see you guys next time. Bye, everybody. I want to hear from you, too.